Grace unto you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> to be quite honest with you, I'm a little uncomfortable with the central thought of today's message. I'm not uncomfortable because I think there's something that needs to be said because that's not the case. Not in any way responding to any perceived or unperceived attitude by anybody or collectively not responding to what anybody said or did or anything like that. Quite simply, <clears throat> you probably noticed that I tend to use sermon texts that are one of the three scripture readings for the day. As a church, we follow a three-year cycle of scripture readings. There are three scripture readings in each one of those three years. So for the second Sunday of Advent, there are nine different scripture readings. Over the years, there's been a little bit of tweaking of some of those readings, and uh, this morning's epistle reading was one of those tweaks. Quite honestly, one of the scripture readings for today, I've preached two different sermons on already. Another one I preached one sermon on, and the epistle reading was a, a brand new text. It was one of those tweaked ones that were added, so I've never preached on it. The subject matter is evaluating a public servant's ministry. And so I didn't want you to be thinking and wondering, I wonder who said something to him that he's talking about this. Nobody said anything. In fact, I have great reason to give praise and thanks to God for you. But we are going to be looking at that sermon text today and uh, what it says to us. The Apostle John the, John the Baptist had a very clear understanding of his role and his purpose in God's overall plan. His spiritual heart and head were screwed on straight. He understood, and he said it a little later after the reading of our gospel today, talking about Jesus. He must increase, but I must decrease. He understood that his role was to be directing people to Jesus Christ and the number of people following him was to diminish so that the number of people paying attention to what Jesus was saying was going to be increasing. He understood his role and purpose in ministry and what he was to be at and doing. Conversely, our epistle reading talks about an entirely different situation. The Apostle Paul is writing that letter to the congregation in Corinth and they were divided into a number of different cliques in that congregation. A number of different groups that one group like this preacher that they had, this group like this teacher that they had, this group like that preacher that they had. And in doing that, they were forming judgments and opinions about them, and one being raised and the other demoted in their estimation. And it was causing all kinds of divisions and conflict, and it was more about the preachers than it was about Jesus, finally. Paul has addressed that issue in chapter 3. And now he's continuing that discussion as he now says to them, you know, that a, a public servant of the word needs to be faithful. And that's what we need to be looking for. He says in the opening words of our text, So then, men ought to regard us as servants of Christ. Members of the church are to regard those public ministers of the word they are to look at them, they are to view them as servants of Christ. That word, translated servants, is a word used sometimes to describe an assistant to a medical physician of that day. It's sometimes used to describe somebody who's kind of like a, a leader's right hand man. Very clearly, 
one of those servants, somebody in that kind of role, has got some kind of expertise, some kind of training, but clearly he or her is not her own boss or his own boss. They're working in connection with somebody else who has superior insight and superior skills to theirs. That's the word that was used in our text, that we are to be regarded, he said, as servants of Christ. That Christ has far superior skills, a far more important role, but we have been called to be working in conjunction with Christ uh, in his church here on earth. Not only are the public ministers of the gospel to be regarded as servants of Christ, but he continued, and as those entrusted with the secret things of God. They are to be viewed as somebody to whom God has given a trust, a responsibility. The Lord Jesus has placed something in their hands. The secret things of God. God's sacred secrets. Not that they're secrets that nobody else could possibly know or understand. God's secrets about himself and what he's like and what he's done and what he's promised and what will be. That's all recorded right here. But they are individuals who have been trained in that word, been taught in that word, and, and now that word has been placed into their arm, into their hands, and they are to be utilizing that word and teaching others so that they might grow in it, be drawn closer to the Lord Jesus. They are to be viewed as somebody who has been entrusted with something special from God, God's word to be taught and shared. Viewed as somebody who's a servant of Christ, entrusted with the word of God to be taught about Christ, and then how are they to be evaluated? He doesn't go through any long laundry list of things that one is to look at to try to evaluate that. He simply said, now it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. They are to be faithful. Obviously, if somebody is teaching that word of God wrongly, they aren't being faithful to the word, are they? They aren't being faithful to what has been entrusted to them. Obviously, if a called minister is living a life of open rebellion, a lifestyle that is against God's word, they aren't being faithful to the word. Those kinds of issues are addressed in other places in scripture. That, that's not really the point here. Again, remember the context. The congregation in the city of Corinth had a number of different preachers and teachers. They all were teaching God's word correctly. They weren't diverging from each other or from the word in any way. Nor was their life in open rebellion against God. But they were still to simply be regarded in terms of are they faithfully teaching the word? That's the criteria. And each one of them was to be evaluated in that light. The word of God is going to be shared faithfully. That means that the word of God, the law, is also going to be shared. So that people are aware in a, a general way of their own sinfulness but sometimes in specific ways, in specific situations where God's word needs to be applied that somebody is rebelling against God in the attitude or actions of life. And if that word is going to be shared faithfully, it also means that they, like John the Baptist was doing, are going to be calling people to repentance. Repentance. 
not only to identify the wrong, but to call them to repent, to confess that wrong and to trust in Jesus' forgiveness for it. That's all part of the faithful use of God's word. And that's the criteria of somebody being evaluated in terms of the public ministry. He said, as he continued on in the text, I care very little if I'm judged by you or by any human court. Indeed, I do not even judge myself. My conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait till the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of men's hearts. It can be very difficult to try to get a handle on somebody's motives about things, can't it? We can sometimes be so easily misled by others. Sometimes we can even mislead ourselves. He says... When Jesus returns in glory, he will evaluate the motives of every servant of the word. What are to be the motives for a public servant of the word? Motives aren't really any different from any believer in Jesus. A little bit later, to the same congregation, he writes... The love of Christ compels us. As a believer, we realize the immensity of our sin and the magnificence of God's grace to send his Son to be our Savior. That Christ would love us, as the soloist just sang about that, that he would come for me. Amazing love. And it's that love that compels our life, each one of us as a believer. God always looks at the motives, at the underlying reasons for what's prompting our life, what's directing us, what's moving us. And for the believer, it's always Jesus and what he has already done for us. And that's true for a called servant of the word as well. That what is to be the motive that God is going to look for it's a motive of responding to God's grace. His love expressed for that individual as it's the prompting of for every individual believer in Jesus. You know, at some time, unless Judgment Day comes first, somebody else is going to be standing here. He isn't to be evaluated and compared to me me to him he isn't to be compared to anybody else I shouldn't be compared to anybody else the question is faithful to the word faithful in bringing that word to people in whatever those situations and settings may be has called us to be faithful in Christ and faithful in Christ, motivated by his grace. Well, that's finally true for all of us, isn't it? You know, we can broaden this subject out into a whole wider scope of, of people. Finally, isn't it true that God has placed his word into the hearts of believing parents? And that they are given the responsibility to share that word with their children. Martin Luther didn't write the small catechism so that staff ministers and pastors had an outline of how to teach children God's word. He says right in the opening page so that fathers might teach their children. Parents have been given the primary responsibility. 
because of what God has placed and entrusted into their hearts to be passing that on to their children so that they might grow in faith and life in Jesus. Very similar thing, isn't it? And finally, that's true for all of us as believers. God has placed a, a measure of understanding in our heart and life. He wants us to continue to grow in that, but he's placed a measure of it in our heart because we believe something. And that gives us the opportunity to be able to share it with others who may be discouraged at times or who may know precious little, if anything, about Jesus. He's placed that trust finally into each of our hearts, hasn't he? And he calls upon each of us to be faithful in serving him, overflowing with gratitude because of what he has already done for us in Jesus. As we continue to prepare our hearts to celebrate the coming of the Christ child, we are seeing the magnitude of God's grace that he would send the all-glorious eternal Son of God in human flesh and blood into our world to redeem us. That inspires, that empowers our response of living. And as we revisit it again, it renews us and strengthens us to serve our Lord and our Savior God faithfully with what has been entrusted into each of our hands, including public ministers' hands, to serve that Lord with grateful hearts and to bring that message to people in our families, in our world, in our congregation continue to faithfully serve that Lord and Savior who has given his life for you. Amen. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will keep your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.